Hi, my name's Stuart Lynch, and I'll be your instructor for this Xcode SwiftUI workshop. This workshop and series of exercises will introduce you to Xcode, and you'll build three SwiftUI applications that'll help you improve your development skills and introduce you to some best practices. The workshop's not really intended for absolute beginners, but the content is arranged in such a way that even if your experience is limited, you'll be able to cut and paste code from the provided documentation without getting left behind. You'll have access to all of the completed application and documentation for your personal or instructional use after the workshop's completed. In addition, the documentation provides links to several supplementary videos on several of the topics covered. You'll be able to download the source code and the full documentation for all the projects from the links in the description of each video. I love getting your feedback, so tap the thumbs up button if you enjoyed this video and leave a comment below. Make sure you subscribe to the video and ring that bell to get notifications of new videos. And if you want to support my work, you can buy me a coffee. In the lead up to building our application, I'll give you the basics of creating a new iOS application using Xcode. I'll introduce you to the different aspects of the Xcode interface and share some keyboard shortcuts that you can use to speed up your development and keep you focused. You'll be introduced to the Xcode library where you can get access to drag and droppable controls along with sample code and quick help. We'll take a look at the anatomy of a simple SwiftUI view and the various view components that make up the view that is displayed to the users. And I'll show you how you can navigate around your project using different tabs and how you can have multiple editors on the screen if your monitor is large enough to support them. After that, we'll start application development. The first application is How Much. It's a simple one that will allow you to enter a total and tip percentage along with the number of people in your party so that you can calculate each individual portion. In this tutorial, we'll introduce you to SwiftUI layout system, buttons and pickers, view modifiers, functions, the ternary operator, nil coalescing, modal sheets and presentation detents, the grid view, and all of these are key components to an iOS application. The next application is for your bucket list. It's an application to track a list of things you wish to do or places you wish to visit. You'll learn about list views, the navigation stack, state objects and observable object classes, along with environment objects. You'll use static class properties, text fields, form views, and you'll learn about JSON encoding and decoding, and data persistence, where your content will be stored on the device and remembered between launches. And in the final application, it's Location Finder. And in this application, you'll be able to enter a postal code or zip code for any country and get that location and plot the location on a map. We'll be exploring the use of an external API or application program interface. We'll learn how to create a model from a JSON response from that API. We'll load data from the application bundle, and we'll create a service class. We'll also be learning about Swift concurrency and async and await. And then finally, map kit, so we can plot our location. There's a lot to cover, so supporting documentation and all source code will be available to you should you need to stop and check your work along the way. Hope you enjoy the course. When creating a new Xcode project, you can launch Xcode, and then you can choose to create a new project from the welcome screen. If Xcode is already open, you can choose File, New, New Project. To create an iOS app, choose iOS and App. And then for the product name, that's going to be the name that's displayed on the home screen. So I'm going to create my first application, which I'm going to call How Much. For the team, you can use none or your Apple developer's team name. So if you have an Apple developer account and you're signed in, you'll see your account here. Otherwise, you can just choose none, as we're not going to be running on an iPhone just in the simulator anyway. There must be a unique identifier for the organization name, and it's common practice to use a reverse domain. For example, com.createxall, which is mine. No spaces are allowed. 
you can use anything you like. The bundle identifier isn't editable here on this view, and it's formed by appending the app name to the organization identifier, and replaces all spaces with dashes. For the interface, I'm going to choose SwiftUI, and going forward, I'll always choose SwiftUI. That's my interface of choice, not UIKit. And the language is Swift. This is the future of iOS development, and even Apple declared this at the last WWDC. No other checkbox will be needed or selected for this workshop. Throughout these lessons, we'll learn more about Xcode interface and use different key commands and shortcuts as needed. But it'll help you a lot if you learn how to manipulate tabs and windows and learn a few shortcuts right at the start. I have a series of YouTube videos that will help you get a better understanding of how you can navigate around and manage your files and code. And I encourage you to watch this series of videos as you'll become much more productive when you learn about the different panels and some shortcuts to help you manage the layout. I'm just going to give you the basics here and may introduce some more tips along the way, but your best bet is to spend some time when you have it watching these videos. On the left is the navigator. This is where all your project's files are organized. If you right-click or control-click, you'll see that we can perform a number of different actions here, including sorting by name or type. I never sort, but rather I like to drag and drop files to arrange them the way that I want. And you can even create groups and organize them by these groups. Though these groups are physical groups, and they're stored in your application within folders, as far as Xcode is concerned, this is a flat file system that is known as the application bundle. And we'll get to that in one of our applications. You can dismiss this panel by clicking on this button. But you'll likely be doing this a lot, so learn Command plus Zero keyboard shortcut to toggle that appearance. In the middle is the Editor pane, and this is where we'll be spending most of our time. On the toolbar, you'll see a single tab showing the current selected file. And as you tap on each of the different files in the navigator, the content on the editor changes. And I'll come back to showing you how you can add more tabs and editors in a minute. The editor pane is always visible, and you can't dismiss it. The preview canvas is only present in SwiftUI if your editor is a SwiftUI view and you have what is known as a preview provider struct. We'll be looking at this in much more detail later. The preview canvas visibility can be toggled with the keyboard shortcuts Option, Command, Return, or Enter. On the right is the inspector panel, and the contents here will differ depending on what you've selected in the editor. The attributes inspector portion, as the last tab there, is the most important for understanding and managing your content. As you tap on something in the code, the inspector will change, allowing you to make some modifications here if you like. I have to be honest, I seldom use this as I prefer to enter directly in the editor to make any adjustments, and you will too, I'm sure. I'm sure as you get more comfortable with the different modifiers, you'll be spending a lot less time here. You can toggle the appearance of this view with this toggle button, or you can remember the keyboard shortcut, Option, Command, Zero. The debug area at the bottom is hidden at first, but as soon as you run your application, if there are any warnings or errors, it will appear. And this can be toggled using this button at the bottom, or by using Shift Command Y. And there are two sections to it the variables view on the left, and the console on the right where the messages will get displayed. In this workshop, we'll not be using the variables view, but we will be using the console so that you can hide the variables view if you like when we get there. As I mentioned, you can have more than one editor on the screen, and this can be accomplished in a number of different ways. This button here duplicates the existing editor in a pane adjacent to it. If you place the cursor in the editor and click on another file in the navigator, it replaces that active tab. However, by having two of the same editors available to you side by side means if you have lots of code, you'll be able to view different portions of the same file at the same time while making edits in one or the other.
You can even use keyboard commands on one or more of the identical views to show or hide the canvas and manage other panels so that you can see what you want to see. Instead of just clicking the New Editor button to duplicate an editor, you can Option click on a file in the navigator and that will place the selected one to the right by default. Another great tip though is to use the Option Shift keys when you click on a file in the navigator and then you'll be able to choose where you want it placed. Note each time you tap on a different file, a temporary tab is created at the top of the toolbar. It's in italics, which means it is temporary. So the next time you tap on another file for that active editor, this will be replaced by whatever you've tapped on. However, as soon as you make an edit to a file, it's no longer temporary and the tab is no longer shown in italics, and it will stay there until you close it. So when you tap on another file, a new tab is created, and it is the temporary one, until you make an edit there. Or you can also force a tab to be permanent if it's temporary, by simply double-clicking on the tab. Now the last thing I want to show you in this section is how you can enable code folding. And this is a feature that will allow you to collapse different sections of your code so that you can focus more or copy complete sections of code without having to see and scroll down your views. To enable code folding, go to the Xcode Settings menu, make sure you select Text Editing, and then check the code folding ribbon to turn it on. Once it's enabled, you'll get a ribbon along the left hand side so that any code block that's surrounded by braces can be collapsed or expanded. When you create a new Xcode project, a default view struct named Content View is created. And this will be the first view that is displayed once your app is launched. This is known as a SwiftUI view. The view struct in SwiftUI is a type of code that creates a view, which is a visual element that can be seen on the user screen. The body in a SwiftUI view struct is like a container, and it holds things that you want to show within that view. The V stack is another container that stands for vertical stack and it positions the views exactly with the default spacing of 10 points. A V stack, like all other containers, can hold up to 10 views and these may be other containers as well, but in this example there are just two views within this V stack. The first is an image view that displays an image that is a system image. And that image has two modifiers applied to it. An image scale, which specifies the size of the image, and a foreground color that applies a color to that image. This is followed by a text view that displays some string of characters. And then that V stack has a padding modifier that adds a default padding of 10 points around all four sides. If a preview provider is provided, it will display a canvas displaying the view within the parent container. The plus button on the top right gives you access to the Xcode library. And here you'll find a lot of useful controls, modifiers, and symbols that you can use when adding elements to your canvas or to your code. For example, we can drag a button from the library right out onto our code editor. And when we do that, the library disappears, giving us a full view of the editor. Optics from the library need to be dropped inside a container like a VStack. And then when we hover over it here, space is made way for you to drop the code. When you tap on a drop control, you'll see that the placeholders are highlighted in blue, which means it wants you to replace it with something. You can just tap enter on the keyboard and this will fix it. And whatever the placeholder was, that's what will remain. So for example, we can leave it here as button. The action placeholder, however, isn't really code yet, so I'm just going to remove it. If I reveal the attributes inspector, remember, option, command, zero, that will reveal it. And since our button is selected, 
we can use the inspector to make some modifications. So you can see that the both the code and the previews are updated as we update this label. Now I have to admit I seldom do this as I much prefer editing directly in the code, and I think that you too will once you're familiar with controls and their modifiers. Now speaking of modifiers, let me bring up the library again and go to the modifiers tab. Not all of these modifiers apply to all controls, but let me find the one for foreground color because we've seen that already, and drop it after the button. The default color that's entered is blue, but it's just a placeholder and I can change it to, say, orange. Now this only applies to the button label. And I can also increase the size of my preview here by tapping on this button. When you add views to your canvas, they're centered in absolute center of the space made available to it, unless you override that. And this is why that entire V stack is in the middle of our view. Swift controls or views will either take up as much space as they need or all the space made available to it. So let me try to show you this. If after the padding I add a border modifier using dot border, then I can provide it with an argument and it's expecting a color. Well, code completion in Swift is great. All I have to do is type a period, and it's going to present me with the most common options for color. So let me use purple. And then, as you can see, this border is attached to the VStack after the padding has been applied. If I add another border before the padding, like this, so this time let me choose a color of green, we'll see that the VStack itself encapsulates all three of the views within it, one after another, and the VStack's width is exactly the width of the widest element, the text view, and the height is the sum of all three put together. By adding padding, I'm generating a new view that is now larger, but everything inside is centered. And you can see the globe is centered horizontally as well. Another useful tab on the library is the last tab, which is the one for the SF symbols. And these are Apple's glyphs that you can use in all of your projects. We can choose one of them and drag it onto the top of our VStack. Notice that the default foreground color for this image is black, whereas the one below had been set to something else called accent color. If I remove the foreground color from just applying to the button and instead apply it after the closing brace for the V stack, the color then gets applied to all of the enclosed views except for the globe image as it had its own accent color set internally and it'll override anything further down in the hierarchy. Let me open the library once more now and search for a color object. Just color, not foreground color. And I'm going to drag this out onto our VStack above the archive box image that we just dropped. Now this view doesn't know how big it's supposed to be, so it just takes over all of the space available to it, with the exception of some predefined safe areas on the sides. The color definition here just uses RGB values, but there are many different color overloads to construct a color object. Just like the border, we could have used just one of the predefined colors. Now, just one more thing. Up until now, we've been dragging our views onto the editor. If you make your preview canvas selectable by clicking this button, we can drag onto the canvas. Now we can bring up the library and drag onto the canvas, and both it and the code gets updated. Also, if you find it frustrating that the library keeps disappearing when you drag, you can keep it open by holding the Option key down when you click on the plus button. That way it stays open until you close it. Well, that's the basics. You've got enough information now to start coding. So in the next tutorial, we'll start to design our first application.